smiling faces to hear your conversations going on out there as you uh, welcome each other. Let's take our hymnals, turn to hymn number 503, great hymn of testimony 503, sing all three verses since Jesus came into my heart. Has there been a change since Jesus came into your heart? 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, then he is a new creation. Amen? Let's stand together and let's sing that. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. What a joy for my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart, I have ceased from my wandering and going astray. Since Jesus came into my heart, and my sins, which were many, are all washed away. Since Jesus came into joy for my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart I shall go there to dwell in that city I know since Jesus came into my heart and I'm happy so happy as onward I go since Jesus joy or my soul like the sea fellows roll since Jesus came into my heart amen amen oh and then you, one more time amen amen, amen. Well, a little bit happier than that there we go brother Lewis would you lead us in an opening prayer please please Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Did you hear that roll of thunder? Yes. Yes, Lord. I was thinking I was already giving up. It wasn't coming. I've not looked outside in just a little bit, but uh, we pray that it does rain. It, we had a little shower here today. Maybe you had one in your neighborhood, but uh, we are thankful for that. But we do pray. We're sorry that the uh, uh, the field of faith, they were supposed to be on the football field tonight, but they've had to move that inside to the arena. But we're going to be praying also for all the students who are coming together there to worship tonight and uh, hope that that's a night that even many come to know Jesus tonight. Again, uh, our list there, Soul Sisters, are going to be meeting this uh, this Friday morning at 10 o'clock and uh, they'll be meeting upstairs and you're welcome to come be part of that. Pastor Appreciation Picnic, Sunday at 4, the next chance of rain is Sunday afternoon, but 
like, all right, that's all right, we'll take it. And uh, Sunday at 4, hamburgers and hot dogs will be provided. Uh, but we're asking you to please bring your own drinks, your chairs, your shade canopies, your umbrellas, whatever you need. And, uh, and uh, so come and be part of that. There will be bounce houses for the kids. And uh, we're asking if you can bring a dish. Uh, there's a list out there if you haven't already signed up uh, by initials of what they're asking you to bring. And we appreciate that very, very much. Um, quarterly business meeting would not be this Sunday, but the 23rd. And we ask you to come and help us again at that time. Faith Fall Family Festival. And that's going to be Saturday, October 29th from 4 to 6 o'clock. There'll be many volunteers, just people to come and welcome our neighbors and uh, the children and uh, just uh, come and, uh, and be part of that. You can host a trunk. I promise you, we will find you a job. And so if you can come and be part of that, we appreciate it also. Families and individuals not previously included in our church directory. Uh, we're encouraging you to complete a, a membership profile. They're out there at the visitor center and uh, to... Uh, Maybe submit a, uh, a picture from your family. We'll take your picture. And, uh, but we, uh, we would like to get that updated just as soon as possible. And Lynn is asking that uh, those things be here by Monday, October the 31st. And we appreciate that very, very. We've had several ask us about when are we going to update that directory? It's, it's in the works. So you just hold on, all right? Uh, Soul Sisters are going to have retreat uh, Friday, November the 4th from 9 to 3 at the Sanctuary in um, the Soul Bay neighborhood in Little Rock. Cost is $15. And uh, again, if you have questions about that, you talk to uh, one, of the, one of the Soul Sisters, and they'll give you much help about that. And then Hope's Closet will be giving away boxes of hope for families in our community this holiday season. And again this year, they're asking Faith to help them with this outreach effort uh, by collecting we need 400 boxes of macaroni and cheese. We can do that. We did it last year. And so we need your help with that and just to help our community and the people just to uh, have a little little joy and great time during the holiday season. So uh, there will be a cart. There's a smaller cart over here on the other side in the foyer, and uh, you can put those items in there. And we're asking to have those by November the 16th, and we appreciate that very, very much. All right. Let's sing a couple more songs. How about singing with me? Uh, one of my favorite, I, I, Lily of the Valley. You know, I just have stories. I've been in church all my life. My mom sang this song at home all the time. If she was washing dishes, if she was just working, she was singing the Lily of the Valley much of the time. And that's 626. And then I'm going to ask you to turn back to 611 and kind of hold that with your finger there. He hideth my soul. So we're at 626 and then 611, please. I have found a friend in Jesus. He's everything to me. He's the fairest of 10,000 to my soul. The lily of the valley, in him alone I see. All I need to cleanse and make me fully whole. In sorrow he's my comfort, in trouble he's my stay. He tells me every care on him to roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He all my griefs have taken, and all my sorrows borne. In temptation, he's my strong and mighty tower. I have all for him forsaken, and all my idols torn. From my heart, and now he keeps me by his power. Though all the world forsake me, and Satan tempt me sore, through Jesus I shall safely reach the goal. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. He will never, never leave me, nor yet forsake me here. While I live by faith and do his blessed will. Oh, wall of fire about me, I've nothing 
and face where rivers of delight shall ever roll. He's the lily of the valley, the bright and morning star. He's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Amen. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of a rock where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand, and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me with his hand. And again, the church, we say, amen, amen. Our prayer list tonight, if you remember them, Miss, uh, Miss Wilma Faulkner, uh, we said she's had, had a fall this past week at the bus barn at the school, and uh, her shoulder was not broken. We are certainly thankful for that. But the doctor thinks that there is some damage in there, and uh, maybe a rotator cuff, and so she is waiting for an MRI uh, to see what's going to have to be done there, so please continue to remember she's in, she's in uh, much, uh, much pain, but she's been here today working, and uh, uh, she's still on her bus. She's not driving the bus, but they said that they could use her on the bus, and her children want her on the bus, so she's been uh, on the bus, and you, you remember her. Cecil Gangliff had to go to St. Vincent's North last night, chest pain. Uh, they have done a heart cath today. Uh, they have not seen the doctor this evening to know the results of that test yet, and uh, so it'd probably be tomorrow. And so remember him. He's in 408 at St. Vincent North, and we appreciate that. Uh, Brother Kerry Howard, continue to remember him. He's getting stronger. He's at 408 at Greystone Rehab, so continue to remember him. The Lasters, we ask you to remember them. Brother Fred had his first treatment yesterday and uh, has been home resting today, so please uh, remember him. Uh, Eugene McCann, uh, Eugene uh, last Friday um, had a, uh, uh, no, an ablation. He had an ablation, and, uh, but it wasn't successful. And so he is back home recovering and doing well and uh, will be going back to his doctor and uh, seeing what, what the next step is. So please uh, remember him, Marcella. We appreciate that very, very much. Again, we've had several in our, in our church family who have lost loved ones. Miss Catherine Ryder and the passing of her sister, Mickey Hartz. Uh, Don Forster and the passing of his sister, Dolores Perry. Uh, Miss Dodie Pitkin and her husband, Donald, and the passing of his father, Donald Pitkin Sr. His visitation will be tomorrow evening from 6 to 8 at the Moore Funeral Home here in Cabot. And then his memorial service will be Friday at 10 o'clock at the Cabot Church of Christ. So please remember him. Also, Maria Ryder uh, Pogue, uh, the family and the passing of her brother, and Tommy Ryder. And you just please lift up that family. We appreciate that very, very much. Uh, Carlos and Leanne Jones for several weeks been asking us to please remember uh, great nephews of theirs. Mr. Callan Floyd's two years old, and Callan's had open heart surgery today to go in and to repair a hole in his heart. 
It took 20 minutes, and that's a blessing, and they said it was very successful, and uh, also thought there would be some some more surgery because of the leaky heart, but they said that is not uh, a serious problem, and so uh, they did that heart surgery, and they got out very quickly, and so they are thankful for that. And then they had another uh, great nephew, Archer, Archer Shirley, and Archer has had a uh, uh, infection and was on a respirator, and he is better. And so, again, that family is giving all the praise to the Lord today to what, what's going on in their life, and we appreciate that very, very much. Um, please remember uh, Miss Karen Garrett's sisters, asking to uh, remember them, uh, Teresa Warsham, uh, she She's in Bartlesville, Oklahoma, bladder cancer. Please remember her. And then her other sister, Karen, is fighting breast cancer. And so, you know, they appreciate that very, very much. And then there's just one other. I just wish you to uh, remember right now, Brandon McMinn. Brandon is the young man who was, uh, uh, again, off off a bull this summer at a a high school rodeo and... uh, he has been recovering, and the Lord has done marvelous things. Uh, he, uh, again, is in the cast of the music man at the high school this week, and uh, he is dancing in a wheelchair, and uh, he is moving, and then last night, opening night, the wheel come off the wheelchair, and uh, but he anyway got that thing off the off the stage and just continued moving and uh, so he can walk and uh, so that's amazing but tonight at the field of faith he is giving his testimony and uh, again this uh, this community and and those in his circles in the school know that he's a believer and he's sharing that tonight so we just pray that even tonight again that young men and women come to know Jesus amen are there others that you'd like for us to remember tonight Are there others? Yes, sir. praying about that the lord knows got that under control all right let's go to the father in prayer father god we come to you again this evening we thank you again for the privilege to be in your house we thank you again that we can come together open your word and uh, that we can just study the scripture together that we can bring you these requests and we just bring you all these that right now need our prayer and we just uh, thank you for your goodness we uh, pray for these families who have lost loved ones and that they pray that they know they will see their loved one again one day. Again, Lord, we uh, make this request of uh, uh, this heart and uh, maybe a pacemaker. But, Father, you're in control, and we just trust you, and we lean on you. Father, we lift up Brandon tonight as he shares his testimony. Just give him super strength, Father God, that boldness that uh, everyone in that room knows that his hope and his faith is in you. Again, thank you for his family and the faith they have showed to to you and to their son these past months continue to bless them again lord we uh, just uh, lift up cecil tonight as he's waiting the word on on his heart condition you know his needs and father again we are blessed we thank you for our salvation the power that you give us in times of need and we just know you are our only hope father and we just lift up our awana clubbers tonight and we just ask you tonight that you and Convict those little hearts, Father, and just that they come to know you as Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you for the leaders. We ask you to bless them. Thank you for the parents, and the uh, grandparents, the neighbors who have brought these children. And help us, Father God, that we uh, honor you by honoring them. We lift up our students tonight who are at the field of faith. And we ask you to bless that service and that you do mighty things there. And that many, many, many young people come to know you as Lord and Savior. Thank you for Rich as he brings the word tonight. And again, all we do or say bring you honor and glory. In your name we pray. Amen.
we are hoping that it's raining outside. Amen. I tell you. Oh, it's been a long, long dry spell around here, but uh, we've seen them before. And uh, it's, it's funny. Uh, I, I don't know why it is exactly, but uh, maybe it's just uh, something that comes along with age. I don't know. But, um, you know, it seems like every time we have something like this, I, I start noticing uh, some of the young people talking about, man, the White River's dry. It's dry. Oh, it's dry. Yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> We've seen it dry before, hey, Ben? I'll tell you. It's, uh, uh, man, it's going to snow. Yeah, yeah. We've seen that before, too. Ice, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then some of us just trust God so much it's pitiful. You know, um, one of the things the Bible tells us, warns us about is, is not letting our hearts fail us for fear. God's not giving us a spirit of fear. And uh, we know that God is with us and he's going to take care of us. As Brother Bill is so fond of saying, because we know Jesus Christ, the worst thing that could ever happen to anybody is not going to happen to us. To live as Christ, to die as gain gain so um, anyway I still enjoy the rain when it comes what a blessing that is a simple thing tonight we're going to be looking in first John first John chapter 2 if you don't have your Bibles but you have your phone uh, pull up BibleGateway.com BibleGateway.com uh, you can look at a passage in all kinds of different versions, a lot of study tools there. If you're not familiar with Bible Gateway, this would be a great night to do it. BibleGateway.com. Maybe you've got a Bible program already on your app, on your phone. First John chapter 2. We talk about testing our testimony. Testing our testimony. First John chapter 2. I'm going to pull out three passages. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 4. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. He who says. Verse 6. He who says, he abides in him, ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Verse 9. He who says, he is in the light. And hates his brother is in darkness until now. You see then that John is talking about our testimony. What we say. What we say. Our testimony. He who says. He who. Anybody. Not just he. She's would be included. Anybody who says. He who says. And there's always something that we're saying about our Lord Jesus Christ. And when you see those kind of things in Scripture, just stacked in one on top of the other, God does that so we'll pay attention and we'll notice. There's something here he wants us to see. He who says, he who says, he who says. Our testimony. Um, in today's world, testimonies are big business. Big business. Companies pay a lot of money to get people to give them testimonies about their products, or at least they offer it. Uh, I remember I was thinking about this uh, this week as I was writing this and thinking about testimonies. There's one company I deal with online, and every time I buy something from them, I get an email from them the next day saying, would you review this product? If you'll review this product, then we'll give you a gift. Well, I've reviewed I don't know how many products, and I ain't got a gift yet. Not a one. Uh, I, I didn't even get a thank you. That's what was odd. But at least they're willing to offer a lot of money. Maybe some of you get to follow through there. It just, it's amazing. It seems like anymore, if you just show up in their business, you get an email when you get home. How'd you like our store? I don't know how they knew I was there. Uh, maybe it's that facial recognition te uh, technology. I don't know. It's kind of scary. But testimonies, we all know, testimonials are big business. If we buy a product, somebody will want us to give our testimony. Um, even in the pre-internet days, they still had commercials. <laughs> 
I always laughed when I saw those uh, commercials that said, now, these are real people, not paid actors. <laughs> oh, I laugh at that. I, I laugh about it. It said it right here. That's just as funny as it gets right there. Oh, we're not paying these people. No, no, no. Sure, they're paying for them. They might not be actors, but it is a commercial. Testimonies. Testimonies. Part of the reason I wanted to bring this to you tonight was to remind you about how important your testimony of Jesus Christ is. Just in the world that we live, folk, the world we live in, you're going to buy something, the chances are before you buy it, you're going to check the reviews. You're going to see what people say. If you're like me, you're not just going to read the five-star reviews. You're going to read the one-star reviews, the people who had problems, and see if there was something that was taken there. So we know about how important it is to have good reviews. Ask any business anywhere, and they'll tell you the power of personal testimony, how important it is uh, to get that a good, satisfied customer who's out there making good things and saying good things. If you're a born-again, blood-bought child of God tonight, let me tell you something. You are a satisfied person. I'll tell you, Jesus Christ has done great things for you. He has blessed you over and over and over again. And the world needs to hear that. If, if we can give a review on all these other things, surely we can give a review about what Jesus Christ has done for us, what our testimony is, our testimony about our church. It's a great thing to be able to talk to people about uh, what we do and how God is, is working here and the great things that we see here and how we're blessed. You are indeed real people. <laughs> uh, nobody will ever pay you for, to give a testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. Until that is, you get to heaven. <laughs> That's, you see, where the reward comes in. You understand? Because Jesus said, not even a cup of cold water given in my name will pass his recognition. You'll in no wise use your reward, lose your reward. How much more then those testimonies? Well, John, in our text tonight, is going to talk about putting our testimony to the test. And that's because as good as it is for us to have testimonials and as powerful as they are, as important as those reviews are, we also know that there's some unscrupulous people out there in the world who really are paying people to give a testimonial and you know how it is. There's people who are writing reviews of hotels that have never stayed there. You're writing reviews of restaurants that they've never eaten there. And it's unscrupulous. If it's not against the law, it ought to be because it's just fraudulent to do those kind of things. It's, it's terrible to claim that you have a testimony of something when in fact you don't. It would be even worse to make a testimony of Jesus Christ if you don't know him. And so John in this passage is going to be talking about giving a test to our testimony. To make sure that our testimony then is authentic. It's not the first time in this short book that he brings this up. I want to show you three passages in chapter 1. Where he was describing things people were saying. Verse 6, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. If we say. Verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him, that's God, a liar and his word is not in us. So immediately we see some similarities to the talking that was going on in chapter 1 and the talking that he's talking about in, in chapter 2. If we say, if he, he, he that says, if we say. He speaks of fellowship in verse 6. But he speaks of knowing God in chapter 2 and verse 4. If we say that we have fellowship with God in chapter 1 and walk in darkness. 
if we say that we know God and do not keep his commandments. You see the similarities between those two passages. It's have no sin. If a man says, I have no sin. If a man says, I have not sinned. Uh, he says we deceive ourselves and make God a liar. So he talks about the ongoing problem of sin. Now, it might be easy for us or easier for us to accept all of this in chapter 1 if John was talking about people who didn't know God at all, really. But that's not what he's talking about in chapter 1. He addresses himself to my little children, to people who are saved. And so it's saved people who would say uh, that they have fellowship with God, but when they're walking in darkness... John says, you're lying to yourself. The reason for that is obvious. John tells us, 1 John chapter 1, he tells us that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So if we're walking out in the darkness of sin and telling ourselves that us and God are still getting along and we're in fellowship, you're kidding yourself. God has no capacity to fellowship with us if we're choosing to walk in the darkness. And that doesn't mean we don't still have a relationship with God. Uh, we all know people, and maybe we've experienced it ourselves, though, when we're in relationship with somebody, but we don't have much fellowship. That can happen in the closest relationship of all, our marriage. It can happen between parents and children. It can happen between brothers and sisters. They have relationship, but no fellowship. And as sad as it is, if a husband and wife are in relationship, but they have no fellowship, they're strangers living in the same house. As sad as it is for parents and children to have relationship, a mother that, that birthed that child out into the world, and yet the child has nothing to do with the mother or father, and the, and the child wouldn't be there if it wasn't for them. They have no relationship. They have no fellowship. They got relationship. No fellowship, siblings, brothers and sisters, relationship, but no fellowship. As sad as it is in all those human relationships, it's even worse for us to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ and yet not be in fellowship with Him. If we say that we have fellowship with God and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth, and yet He's quick to remind us that being in fellowship with God doesn't mean that we'll not still have a problem with sin. I've told you this before. I'll tell you again tonight. As long as we're living in these bodies, these are sin-cursed bodies. And as long as we are in these bodies and these feet are walking around on terra firma, <laughs> terra firma, on solid ground and out on streets paved with gold, as long as we're in these bodies and on this planet. Sin's going to be a problem. Sin is going to be a problem to us. If we deny that and say we have no sin, John says we're kidding ourselves. And if we say that we haven't sinned, when God is convicting us of our sin and we're arguing with God and saying, no, it's not bad, I, it, it, it's okay. Well, there's an epidemic of that in America today. The things that God said, this is wrong, this is sinful, and yet people are calling what is wrong right, and we're arguing with God. Uh, and his word, John says, is not in it. So there's some similarities in 1 John chapter 1 as he talks about the things we say, what our testimony is, what we are declaring about ourselves. But the meaning is different because in chapter 2, He's really talking about our testimonies, testimonials that we give to the world. I know him. I abide in him. I'm in the light. Our testimonials to the world where we live. In a very real sense, John is writing to give his own testimony. And if you can't follow, then listen carefully. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, our hands have held or handled concerning the word of life. 
Remember, this is the disciple who of all the disciples was closest to Jesus. They called him the disciple whom Jesus loved. So John is given a testimony. You see that? I'm, I'm going to talk to you about this one that I've, I've seen him. I've, 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 I've handled him. I've touched him. I've looked upon him. I've heard him. I was there. I was there. I was there when he walked on the water. I was there when he turned the water into wine. I was there when he was uh, up on the mountain of transfiguration and suddenly uh, he was transfigured before us and we saw him in his glory. I was there when he raised the dead. I was there when he died on the cross. I was there when he rose from the dead. I mean, you read the story of Jesus and it's just John, 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 John. What's he telling us? I've got a testimony I want to share. About this Jesus that I saw, this Jesus that I heard, this Jesus that I handle, this Jesus that I know. The life was manifested and we've seen and what bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard we declare to you. Don't miss this, he said. That you also have, may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Have you ever walked up to a circle of people who were standing around talking and they didn't let you in? Have you ever done that? You've probably done that in Faith Baptist Church before. <laughs> oh, I tell you, sometimes, folks, we get so caught up in talking to all our buddies and stuff... Take a look over your shoulder every now and then and see that person maybe that's standing over there waiting to get a word in. Speak to them. Say hi to them. Don't leave them out. Oh, it's, it's bad when somebody's in a circle and they won't let you in their circle. I want you to see tonight, John talks about his circle. It's me and Jesus and God the Father. This is cool. John said, we'll let you in our circle. Truly, he said, you, you, your fellowship can be with us. You can have this fellowship. You can be a part of this fellowship. The John who knew Jesus so well, Jesus who's now with the Father, and truly, he says, you can have fellowship with us. See, John's testimony tonight would pass the test. There's no doubt about that. I could have given you, uh, who, who knows, how many other different experiences he had with Jesus. I just mentioned a few, kind of off the top of my head. There could have been so many more. John's testimony would pass the test. He invites us then into his circle so that we can have fellowship with him and Jesus and we can, can know the Jesus that he knows so well. So how do we know that our testimony is, is authentic? Well, the first thing he gives us is the obedience test. He who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. Now to understand this, I, I want to give you another quick couple of quick passages Matthew 7, 21, Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, see, there's, there's that saying again. There's that talking again. Somebody's talking here. Jesus said, Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. You see, there's something else than just saying something, mouthing words, making a profession. And Jesus said it's about doing the will of the Father. So what is the will of the Father? I'm glad you asked because Jesus told us in John 6, 29. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in him whom he sent. You see, what, what God has told us to do is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And I'm not talking about believing in the sense that you celebrate Christmas. I'm not talking about believing in the sense that you give out Easter eggs on Easter Sunday. I'm not talking about believing in the sense that that Crocodile Dundee probably said so so well. Yeah, me and God, we be mates. You know, we're buddies. I hear so many people talking about the big guy. Oh, yeah, I know God. I know God. There's more to it than that. And that is that coming to that time when we recognize that we're sinners and that Jesus Christ died on the cruel cross for sinners. And I'm one of those. And though I deserve to spend eternity in hell, Jesus Christ took the judgment of God for me. So that whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What is that? That is that expression of our belief and trust in Jesus Christ. It's trusting Him. That is what produces what the Bible calls the new birth, being born again. That's how you know God. We don't know God because we feel the presence of God. All that means is that we have a good feeling about God. I read a staggering statistic today, and I don't know where they got them. You know, I... I just, I I looked at it, but there was about almost two-thirds of the population of America claims that God speaks to them directly. Either God or some kind of God, whatever they think is God. We don't know God because we've memorized the Scripture. If we've memorized the Scripture, then we've memorized some portion of His revelation to us, whatever that is. We don't know God because we can talk about God. That just means we can have a godly conversation. We don't know God because we come to church and enjoy ourselves. Uh, That just means we enjoy worship. How do we know that we know God? Jesus is the one who said it. You do what the Father tells you to. And what the Father tells us to do to know Him is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the work of God that you believe in Him. That's Jesus whom He hath sent. Why? Because there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. That's where it all begins. It reminds us then of the fellowship issue that John presented in chapter 1. Um, if we say that we have fellowship with God, we walk in darkness. But then he goes on. He says, but if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. John knows and we know that there'd be people who would claim to know God today as it was so many hundred centuries, eons ago. Today there are people who claim to know God but they have no interest in His Word, no interest in His service, no interest in His church. There is nothing in their life that would identify them as being a follower of Jesus Christ. Nothing. Oh, sure, I know God. Oh, yeah, I know Jesus. No. John said it very simply. The truth is not in you. He was telling us something with that. Because, you see, John remembered that Jesus said, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And though you might say, a person may say they know God, but if they haven't believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, then the one who is the way, the truth, and the life is not in them. If you receive Christ as your Savior, then Christ, by the Holy Spirit, takes up residence in your life. So the truth is now in you. John said it's not. It's not. It's a sobering thing to think about people, as Jesus said it, who would say to him, Lord, Lord. And yet he would respond to them, depart from me, for I never knew you. There is an obedience test. Have you done what God told you to do? And what he told you, this is the work. And that is, believe on him that he has sent. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. That would be a whole other theological discussion tonight for me to talk about. Uh, how that faith is, is, is the antithesis of works. We're not saved by works. And you say, well, how is all that? How does that play out? 
Well, Romans chapter 4, God gave you a great example. I'll just do this real quickly. Romans chapter 4, uh, that's where Abraham, the Bible says, believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And Paul would comment on that and say it, put it this way, but to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So here's these people who came to Jesus saying, you know, what good work must we do? And Jesus said, you believe on the one whom he has sent. That was the answer. Secondly, then, there's an obedience test. That is to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you done that? Secondly, then, there's the walking test. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Again, in chapter 1, he spoke of walking in darkness or walking in the light. And walking in Judaism had to do with their character of life, where their faith met the reality of their existence, or as we like to say it, where their, their rubber met the road. It's uh, where what they believed then becomes their practice. And in, in Judaism, that was spelled out in a lot of different ways by the law. But God gives us a simple plan to follow when it comes to our walk. How do we live out our faith? We walk like Jesus walked. Isn't that a simple plan? <laughs> oh, but it's a glorious plan. <laughs> oh, we, we'll never live up to that one. Uh, I just want to read to you several passages of Scripture about walking. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. So there's a part of our life that's still walking in the flesh. Yeah, we've got a fleshly body. We've got fleshly feet. Galatians 5 and verse 16, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. There's a greater power in you and a greater power in me than the power of the flesh. And that's the power of the spirit of God. I've used this illustration before, so if you've heard me use it and remember it, uh, just bear with me because there's people here tonight that hadn't heard it and people watching at home. Uh, there is a law, it's called the law of gravity. Law of gravity says what? What goes up must what? So you go down to Little Rock Airport or just hang around here for about 15 minutes and you see all them C-130s come flying over and they're staying up in, in the sky. How are they doing that? Are they defying the law of gravity? No. There's another law called the law of aerodynamics. And the law of aerodynamics says with the right kind of wingspan and enough thrust, then that bird can... Get up in the air, and it can stay up as long as those jet engines or, or the big props keep turning and the jet engines keep pushing. You see, the law of gravity wasn't overcome or beaten or, or destroyed. They didn't defy the law of gravity. Uh, it was just overcome by a greater law, a more powerful law. The law of the flesh is that we walk in the flesh. But there is a more powerful law in us, and that is the law of the Spirit that can overcome then the pull of the flesh that's always pulling us down. Uh, verse 25, if we live in the Spirit, uh, Galatians 5, 25, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Ephesians 2, 10, for we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus and two good works which God hath before ordained that we should Walk in them. Walk in what? Good works. Ephesians 4, 17. This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds. Oh my. We ought to think about Ephesians 4, 17 a lot in the world that we live in. Because we might see people doing things and wonder how in the world can they do that? How can they do that to themselves? How can they do that to, them ki to their kids? The Bible says it. There are people who walk in the vanity of their minds. Their mind is empty. Ephesians 5, 2. Walk in love. Colossians 4, 5. Walk in wisdom. I could give you many, many more passages about the walk. He who says he abides in him, that is, that I'm in Christ, we need to think about how we're walking. That's our living, our lifestyle. Our obedience is a test to our testimony. 
our walk that's a test to our testimony. The last one may seem strange, but it shouldn't. And that's the hate test. The hate test. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there's no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Uh, John then tells us a couple of things that hate does to us. Hate puts people in darkness. Go back to chapter 1. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship in one with another. But if we say that we have fellowship with God and walk in darkness, hatred puts you in the dark. And hatred puts people in blindness. Why? Because when they're full of hate, they can't see anything but hate. And they're blind. I grew up in the 1960s and 1970s in a small town in South Arkansas. I learned early on in life that a lot of people hated other people just because of the color of their skin, their ethnicity. It was puzzling to me. Uh, I was so confused. I remember one day that our washing machine went out. And uh, so we went up to the washateria to wash clothes. I had noticed this building painted white. I'd noticed that there was another washateria just about half a block over painted brown. And the white washateria had a sign on the door. It said, white only. White only. I said, Brother Rich, you grew up in that world? I sure did. I sure did. I went up to help mom do our clothes, and I looked in that basket, and she had all sorts of colored clothes in there. I said, Mama, you can't take them in there. She kind of chuckled, too. But then when she explained to me what that meant, I thought, that don't make no sense. It doesn't make any sense. See, hate does that to you. It makes you blind. All you can see is hate. And I've lived long enough to know that hate doesn't really know any racial boundaries. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. You can have a heart that's full of hate. What I'm here to tell you tonight is, is that hate is incompatible with the Christian message. God is love. God is love. And just as much as we'd say that God is light and him is no darkness at all. You know, God God loves people. He doesn't hate people. He hates sin. But God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's just one thing. We can hate people who disagree with us. Hate people because they have different ideas or different ideologies. We can hate people even who have different beliefs. But John tells us this. If we say we are in the light, then hate has no place in our life for people. And that's what he talked about, our brothers. Doesn't mean we can't still hate sin. We can. Doesn't mean we can't still hate evil and all those who practice it, that we can't hate violence and crime and all the things that go along with it. Obviously, we can. I hate the devil. Hope you do, too. I don't know what I'm going to do during the thousand-year reign of Christ, but if God gave me a big stick and let me torment the devil for a thousand years while he's got him chained up, I'd be okay with that. He certainly give me a lot of grief. Has he give you a lot of grief? God talks about hating our brothers. That's what it comes down to. That's not a a sign of being a believer in Christ. He who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness. And doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. The hate test. Test her testimony tonight. 
We're going to say that we're in the light. We're going to say that we abide in Christ. If we're going to say that we know Christ, then we need to put that to the test. And make sure that our testimony is authentic. I'm not going to tell you tonight that we won't occasionally mess up. We do. That we won't occasionally fail. We will. That we don't fall short. We do. But we have that marvelous passage that John just told us about. If we confess our sin, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all righteousness. As I like to say it, if we mess up, fess up. If we mess up, fess up. Tell God. Speak to those maybe that we've wronged. Make it right. God will forgive us. So putting the test to our testimony, just a simple little message tonight, remind us two things. Number one, we've got one. The world needs to hear it. And number three, we need to make sure our testimony is real. Let's stand together, please, and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you for the time we have to gather around your word tonight and study its truth. Thank you for making it real in our hearts and lives and reminding us of how much we need to make sure that we're given our testimony and this world in which we live, and that our testimony is real. There's one here in this building tonight or watching from home, uh, Lord, that needs to receive you as their personal Savior. Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. And that's draw them, convict them of their sins, show them of their need to trust in you before it's eternally too late. And then let them live out, help them to live out that truth, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.